Thank you for joining us today for our third webinar in a series that focuses on improving immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence workflows. Today's webinar is about maximizing signal retention in immunofluorescence. This will be presented by my colleague, Dr. Craig Powell. Following the 20-minute presentation, we will have 10 minutes for a Q&A session. Please submit any questions you may have using the chat function on the GoToWebinar site, and we will answer your questions. I am now pleased to introduce to you my colleague, Dr. Craig Powell. Over to you, Craig. Thanks, Byron. Hello, everyone, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be located around the globe. Thank you for joining us for this third webinar in our series. Our focus today, as Byron mentioned, is about immunofluorescence. Brief overview of the webinar we'll be presenting today. I'll give you an idea of the scope of the webinar, the specific immunofluorescent application we'll be describing and discussing. And then we'll get into optimizing and maximizing conditions uh, to retain the signal to uh, certainly uh, give you the best result at the end of the day. We'll look at detection methodology and preservation of signal, which will be a discussion on antifade mounting media. Okay, so the scope of the webinar today, we'll be talking about epifluorescent microscopy. I do know there are a lot of investigators out there working on live cell microscopy and super resolution microscopy. We can't do justice to those in the 20 minutes we have, but epifluorescence microscopy is a workhorse application. It's a mainstay of many labs, and therefore we'll be focusing on that today. And in particular for epifluorescence, we're looking at say tissue sections that have been cut on a cryostat or a vibratome, for example, uh, and mounted onto a glass slide or cells that have been uh, grown on a cover slip or a slide as a monolayer fixed and therefore stained. And the epifluorescence here utilizes the color of the actual fluorophores to identify and differentiate the target antigens and cellular components. And I've got an example here on the slide showing a double label, cytokeratin in red, desmin in green, and then a blue counter stain. And obviously it's leveraging the color here of the different fluorophores to identify these target antigens. So this is what we're talking about today. So the essence of the epifluorescent application here is the use of this fluorophore, the characteristics it absorbs light at a specific wavelength. This is the excitation spectra, and then it emits light at a different wavelength. That's the emission spectra. And I've got a couple of cartoon diagrams down the bottom here showing a fluorophore being excited uh, by a wavelength of light and then emitting that uh, in a changed state, uh, a specific light color so that can be visualized under the microscope. And those who are interested in the actual atomic uh, arrangement uh, can have a look at some of the uh, uh, information that's available through some of our microscopy uh, company friends on, on the internet. So let's get into the actual workflow, the immunofluorescent workflow. Tissue preparation is of the utmost importance. And I've listed here a couple of things to consider. One is fixation conditions. And what I mean by that is choice of fixative and how long it may be in the fixative. So for example, if an investigator was working with a whole mount or an embryo, say a xenopus or something like that, that is a fairly large chunk of tissue, uh, you'd wanna make sure that the inside is fixed. So simply dropping it into fixative you know, for 12 hours may not fix the inside of the tissue and that could lead to loss of signal or low staining in the interior. So certainly put it in for your 24 hours or even 72, that, the difference there is not going to be an over fixation. That goes out to weeks or so. So just make sure that those parameters are met. Uh, additionally, storage conditions, particularly for the blocks and when you're cutting sections as well, things such as frozen tissue sections, when you go to store those in the freezer, don't leave them there for many months. Uh, they will incur freezer burn that may or may not be evident that will certainly reduce uh, antigenicity of the, of the stain later on. 
A third point is antigen retrieval. This tends to be still a, a large hurdle for investigators in immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence. Uh, so make sure those parameters are optimized. I do have a, a small asterisk there by antigen retrieval. Some investigators out there might be thinking, you know, I, I work on frozen material, so therefore I don't uh, have to look at using antigen retrieval. Well, certainly there is literature out there uh, whereby others have looked at using these heating methods on frozen tissue, believe it or not, uh, it's, and, and actually seen uh, an increase in antigenicity and staining in some of these tissue blocks. So if you're out there working with frozen material, experiencing low signal for immunofluorescence, maybe look at the literature and see uh, how you can potentially uh, increase the signal uh, with some of these methodologies. Now these uh, three points I've got here do have a significant influence on the signal intensity you'll get at the end. So this is extremely important. Further on in the workflow, we'll be, we're looking here now at the detection reagents. And I've got a very basic step two through five methodology here for immunofluorescence, which may or may not be what you're doing. But nonetheless, the point of this slide is to indicate that you have to employ the appropriate, uh, a correct positive and negative controls. Now, the positive and negative controls was a focus of our second webinar three weeks ago. So if anyone is looking for insight into those, I'd recommend you go back and revisit that particular webinar. So the detection methodology is the, certainly one of the largest parameters whereby you can increase the sensitivity of the signal and retain that fluorescent signal uh, to maximize it so you can then interpret the data uh, and image it successfully. So this gives a segue now into look at some of the actual detection methods. And I'll, I'll go through these relatively quickly. But for those new to the field, it might give you some, some insight into what is available. A directly conjugated primary antibody, I'd say that is fantastic if you're doing flow cytometry, but not so much for tissue-based immunofluorescence. Uh, it's, low in, it's low sensitivity. Uh, certainly the conjugation may compromise binding affinity and specificity, and it also has to be used in high concentrations, which certainly would be uh, very expensive in the long run. And, uh, certainly another point would be if you were hoping to look at different primary antibodies, different target antigens, or indeed a different colored fluorophore, you're tied into that conjugated primary antibody. So there are certainly better options. And one of them is this one-step methodology, whereby you use an unconjugated primary antibody followed by a fluorescent secondary antibody of your choice. And this is very easy to swap between primary antibodies and secondary conjugates. A further, more sensitive methodology would be a two-step biotin-based system, whereby you've got a biotinylated secondary antibody and then your choice of, say, avidin or streptavidin fluorophore. For those who are maybe using one of these and looking for further sensitivity, I do have here steps uh, you know, one through three, which is the what I showed just before, the use of a biotinylated secondary antibody, and then a streptavidin and fluorophore of your choice. Step four, you'd apply this reagent, a biotinylated anti-streptavidin, and then reapply that streptavidin and fluorophore. For those investigators who may be working on tissue with high levels of detectable biotin, there are other methods out there that don't incorporate an avin or a biotin type linkage. And what I've shown here in this schematic, unconjugated primary number one. Uh, over here then in slide number, in this particular image in the middle, is an unconjugated secondary antibody, an amplifier, followed by a tertiary, coupled with a lot of fluorophore. And certainly, a lot of investigators are looking into using a tyramide signal amplification or TSA system, also referred to as a CSA, catalyzed signal amplification system. And they're using this successfully in a lot of ways. And basically, it relies on the enzyme horseradish peroxidase 
to catalyze the tyramide to activate it and this is actually a fluorophore conjugated tyramide. The example here is an Alexa Fluor 488 and these then deposit at the site of localization of that target antigen. For those who want to know more about it, I do have a reference down the bottom here. But we're working our way in this webinar through the workflow. We've looked at some tissue prep detection methodologies that you could employ. Hopefully you could uh, look at one of those if you've got low signal. And now this gives us an opportunity to look at fluorophores. So I've got a table here showcasing some of the more popular fluorophores that are used in epifluorescence microscopy. So for investigators uh, who are looking for a single stain, a uh, single fluorescent label for an antigen, you couldn't go too far wrong in selecting one of these particular fluorophores that I've got labeled here. This is not an extensive list by any means, it's just some of the more popular ones that, that investigators use and publish on out there. And certainly, uh, the just to uh, break it down a little bit, obviously these would fluoresce in green, these orange ones in an orange, uh, red and then far red if you are working on confocal. So if you were looking for a double label, you'd use something in the green area, an Alexa Fluor 88, a dilator of fluorescein, and then use something over in this area, a red one, to give you good separation of color. But importantly, before you jump into selecting a fluorophore, let's have a look at the hardware that you've got at your disposal. And very importantly, stay with me on this slide. It might look a little complicated, but it's very important. Have a look at the microscope light source that you've got at your disposal. There are quite a range of different light sources that fluorescent microscopes have. And each of these different light sources discharge light at given wavelengths. Okay, and the example I've got here is a krypton argon light source that discharges light at 568 nanometers and also at 488 nanometers. And you will see that at, and, and I will say that the green uh, uh, line here shows the excitation or the absorption spectra of fluorescein and the red one is the excitation or absorption spectra of Alexa 546. So you will see that at 488 nanometers, this is very close to the peak of the fluorescein molecule, which will give you a very high emission for that given fluorophore. Similarly, for at, at the 568 nanometer range, it's very close to the peak of the Alexa 546 fluorophore. So a krypton argon light source would be a good choice for using either one of these given fluorophores. That will give you maximum signal or very close to maximal signal that you'll observe under the microscope. Uh, one other quick word, if you were to use these in a double label, I've got here spectral overlap. So at 488 nanometers, just be aware that the Alexa Fluor 546 also has a small amount of uh, excitation absorption there, which will emit later on, uh, which could be problematic if you're using both of these for double label. This is where filter cubes would come in and that would give you a more segmented uh, or, or demarcation of the fluorophore emission. So just be aware of what's available uh, in your institute before you select the fluorophore or indeed fluorophores. Now a little bit more about fluorophores, they do exhibit different intensities and photo bleaching rates. And I've got a couple of slides here showing rat dorsal root ganglion sections, some serial sections here, showing uh, dilate 594 and adjacent to that Alexa 594. Very similar molecules uh, and certainly do uh, excite and emit uh, in essentially the same uh, parameters, but you will see that the Dilate 594 seems to show a lot more of these uh, axons, projections in this slide, more than the Alexa dye. I'm not necessarily saying the Alexa dye is inferior here, but it might be showing different intensity or at least photo bleaching rates in this given application. So you will have to be a little flexible 
in your selection of fluorophores. I've got another example showing something similar again, rat striatal neurons. It looks like the dilate 594 is showing more robust staining over the Alexa 594. This may be uh, surprising to some investigators, but again, it might be that the Alexa 594 is not optimal in this given tissue, uh, or indeed maybe photo bleaching more than the dilate 594 in this given application. So just be aware of these parameters and limitations of some of these fluorophores. So fluorophore selection summary, make sure you do select one uh, that, that's an appropriately colored fluorophore for your application. Certainly if you do have a green fluorescent protein uh, being expressed in your tissue, you wouldn't use a fluorescein or another green fluorophore, you'd go with a red one. As we did show in the in the graph there with the, the curves, match the fluorophore with the microscope setup. That's very important to get maximum absorption and emission. Make sure you match it with light source and of course utilize those filter cubes. As we just showed, not all fluorophores generate the same intensity uh, in all specimens and methods. So you will have to be a little flexible uh, to get the maximum signal uh, possible in a given application. And certainly different fluorophores do photo bleach or fade at different rates. And that's possibly something that can be addressed with an anti-fade mounting media. So at this point, let's have a look at anti-fade mounting media. This is where you actually do get to preserve the signal. Now I've got a couple of homebrew uh, type products out there that are used uh, in prevention of, of, of fading of fluorophores. One is n gallate, another one is Moeol Dabco. Just making you aware that they are available out there, recipes are readily available out uh, on, on various websites in the internet. Also commercial vendors have a wide range of fluorophore choices uh, in different flavors I'll say, non-setting, setting, with or without counter stain. So why use an anti-fade mounting media? Well, certainly to prevent the fading of the fluorophore or fluorophores that you've worked so hard to retain and maximize up until this point. Uh, when you're viewing them down the microscope, you don't want that signal to fade away. And as we've got here in this middle image, under a 40X, you will see that the signal after three minutes of observation with anti-fade is retained significantly better than three minutes without an anti-fade. So this is a key reason for retention of signal. You have to use an anti-fade mounting media. However, there are some caveats in selection of the media. Uh, but I will say that choice of media may not matter for certain fluorophores. And what I'm showcasing here is a couple of Vector Shield products. On the left, Vector Shield Vibrance, which does set, and Vector Shield Hard Set, which is also a setting media, an anti fade mounting media. And there, we're looking at retention of a fluorescein FITC conjugated secondary antibody. And if you were looking at both of these individually or without the other being side by side, you'd say, you know what? Those signals are pretty good. Yes, Desmond is there. It looks appropriate to me. Uh, you know, put them together. Maybe the vector shield vibrance is a little more intense, but quite frankly, uh, you might see on a different section the hard set being a little more prominent. So for some certain fluorophores, the choice of media may not be a concern. However, it might be a little different for different fluorophores. And what I'm showcasing here is again the same vector shield vibrance on the left mounting media and vector shield hard set. And you will see for this different dye, this CY5 dye, which is a far red dye, the vector shield vibrance retains this signal significantly better at this exposure rate than the vector shield hard set. So just be aware that the choice of mounting media can be important for certain fluorophores. Now a couple of tricks uh, you can employ when you are observing uh, the specimen under the microscope uh, to retain maximal signal, decrease the exposure time 
under the objective. So with this diagram here, move this objective lens away to say the edge, off the target of interest, do the focusing, set up parameters, etc., and then you can move it back to the target of interest and do the imaging and reporting there. And that will save on exposure time of that key part uh, and give you maximum uh, signal and retention. Uh, another little trick would be to decrease the intensity of that light source coming in uh, from the microscope. Now, that does two things. Uh, it, it certainly would prevent photo bleaching to a large extent, but also uh, would also compromise the actual maximum signal intensity you may get from the fluorophore or the specific uh, target staining. So just be aware of that compromise. Now the choice of anti-fade media may also factor in if you're looking to store the material or archive it for a given period of time. And I've showcased a couple of different media here. There may be a loss of signal to noise ratio, an artifact creeping in after certain storage conditions. So again, just be aware of those factors. And if you were looking to store the material to archive it or image it later on, store it away from the light and certainly for extended periods, days to weeks, put it in the refrigerator. And if you were using a setting mounting media and you're looking to store that over several weeks or months, I would, I would still highly recommend sealing that parameter with a mounting media, with a nail polish or something similar like that. So just very quickly, how would you select an appropriate anti-fade mounting media? I would say if your specimen is less than 10 microns or you're working with a cell monolayer grown on some cover slips or a slide, use a setting media. If it's greater than 10 microns or you're using a volume of media such in a chamber slide or a well format, select a non-setting mounting media. And then certainly it would be up to you whether or not that cell architecture would be important or the morphological aspects and whether or not a counter stain would be important. And as we just showed, uh, there may be some extending circumstances such as selection of certain fluorophores or if you're looking for selection of, or, or multiple fluorophores across the spectrum or if archiving is of interest. All right, so just to sum up, those of you who are interested in our Vector Shield portfolio range, we do have tables such as this one on our website that showcase the hardening parameters uh, and choice of counter stain and unit size. So at this point, I'd like to say thank you very much for tuning into this webinar, and please stay with us for our next webinar coming up on September 15th, counter staining tips and caveats in immunohistochemistry. And right now, I'd like to open up the field to any questions you may have. Thank you. All right, thank you, Craig, for, for that presentation. Uh, at this point, we will now answer any questions you may have. Our first question is, is it advisable to post-fix the sections after immunofluorescence to preserve fluorescence or prevent signal diffusion? Uh, certainly, that, that can, can be done. Uh, this is the, the question is, uh, post fixation and, and what I understand that to be would be a preparation. So obviously being fixed and put onto a glass slide. Let's just say it's a tissue section uh, that's been cut. Uh, it could be embedded in OCT, uh, might be from a cryostat. You'd cut it. It may be the tissue itself was put in as say a biopsy or something like that, uh, fresh frozen and not fixed before it was frozen. Uh, certainly you could do that, you could, you could uh, go through those parameters. Preservation of fluorescence though, uh, yes, certainly depending on the fluorophore, uh, that may, may certainly preserve the signal. So yes, I would certainly explore some of those parameters. I would say probably an aldehyde-based fixative, something like two to 4% paraformaldehyde would be recommended in those circumstances over something like uh, an acetone or, or some other, I'll call it an alcohol solvent based uh, fixative. All right, thank you, Craig. Uh, the next question is, uh, can you combine immunofluorescence and IHC using DAB for double labeling? Uh, yes, yeah, certainly some investigators um, have used uh, double labeling uh, in terms of both a chromogenic and fluorescent-based application. 
Uh, I will say that others have found a DAB, diaminobenzidine, to actually quench some fluorescent signal. Uh, there are better choices of, flu of, of chromogenic uh, companions to fluorophores, I will say. Uh, one is vector SG uh, that we do have. I know there's a paper out there. Uh, the senior author's name was, was Ruskin. Um, if you're interested, please, please uh, send your email to, to technical service and we can send that paper to you that showcased uh, such an example using vector SG with fluorescence. But nonetheless, others have also used a uh, alkaline phosphatase uh, substrate. It's, a, it's vector red or impact vector red. That actually does have the property of fluorescein actually in the red spectra, much along the, the lines of a rhodamine or a Texas red spectra. So you could use that in combination with a green or some other uh, contrasting uh, fluorophore uh, to get to get good good staining. And indeed, others have used um, uh, co-localization with both uh, vector red and a fluorophore. So, so there are certainly some options and parameters out there uh, or selection choices you could use for those immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence, yes. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is, can you overfix the samples or tissue? Uh, what is the result? Yeah, so when I did mention earlier on in the tissue preparation about fixation conditions, I did touch on choice of fixative and the, the amount of time it would be in fixative. And I would say in most research-based applications, the concern for me would be under fixation in the examples I gave, uh, whereby investigators uh, would not leave it in the tissue, leave, say, a, a chunk, I think I use the very scientific word, a chunk of tissue, something like, uh, let's just say it's three millimeters by three millimeters or you know a centimeter by one centimeter they only put it in there for a couple of hours uh, or a brief period of time whereby the center of that tissue does not get fixed something like that you may have to leave it in there for several days and at that point i do not see that as being over fixed uh, you know over fixation uh, would be you know, left in formal and 10% neutral buff and formal, like an archive a museum specimen, you know, for months to years. That that would be my interpretation of overfixation. Uh, and and then, you know, maybe from that left in 70% ethanol. Uh, so to me, the concern mostly is is under fixation for some of these uh, preparations rather than over fixation. And if you go an extra 12 hours or an extra 24 hours, you know, 48 to 72 is not going to be an over fixed preparation. So uh, I would rather the material be fixed than not fixed because some of these antigens you're looking for could be quite soluble uh, in, in an aqueous solution. They're not cross linked with an aldehyde fixative, they're not precipitated with an, with an acetone, and they're going to wash away. And you're scratching your head thinking, gee whiz. You know what what happened to my signal it's supposed to be here and and this is this underscores the importance of some of those tissue preparation protocol optimizations positive control uh, scenarios all right thank you craig the next question is how do i minimize background aside from spinning the secondary antibody aggregates yeah that's fair enough so uh Certainly our first webinar, I'll go back six weeks now, uh, was uh, addressing troubleshooting background uh, in, these, in these applications, immunohistochemistry and immunofluorescence. And importantly, the key thing is to identify the source of the background or indeed sources of background. Uh, secondary antibodies may have some flocculent material in there. Maybe you might get aggregates over time as a concentrate that can be spun down to separate those out. And then when you do, do dilute it out, it might give you a cleaner signal. But if that doesn't, then you're going to have to do a series of defined deletion controls to identify whether or not there may be other segments of the detection methodology that are causing the background or indeed the tissue itself may be autofluorescent and uh, go back and have a look at that we did in the first webinar we did address two sources of autofluorescence one being lipofusion and we did say that 
ink-based reagents that are available commercially out there are very effective in quenching that. And indeed, the other source being, I would say sources, uh, being cellular elements such as red blood cells, collagens, elastins, uh, or indeed due to aldehyde fixation, uh, can certainly be quenched through the use of our reagent, the TrueView uh, quenching kit. So that would be uh, of utmost importance to identify the source or sources of background if you're experiencing that uh, in, in your immunofluorescent assay. It may be something as simple as, as uh, you know, diluting out the primary antibody a little further uh, with a detergent or something like that. But, but nonetheless, uh, that would something you'd, you'd work out uh, on some of your control material. All right, thank you. Uh, the next question is, how can I increase my IF signal if the sample has been overfixed for more than one year in 10% mutual buffer formula and buffer? Okay, uh, there's, there seems to be some concern out here about overfixation, which which I understand, and, and I'm not making light of it by any means. Um, uh, yeah, okay, that's that's fair enough. So my, maybe this was an archive specimen, uh, and you know. You, for whatever reason, we're finally getting around to to, to maybe undertaking that. You know, uh, have a look at the literature out there. I did pop up, um, you know, a, a one reference about and block uh, antigen retrieval in frozen tissue. Uh, I, I would certainly highly recommend looking at antigen retrieval methodologies for overfixed material, particularly if it is an aldehyde base fixative. Um, which, which, which it, it is. Uh, so, so certainly that would be recommended. Uh, you might have to try a number of different uh, buffer solutions, maybe a citrate, uh, sodium citrate, citric acid, maybe an EDTA at a higher pH, indeed maybe even a protease digestion, uh, particular to your given antigen that you're looking for. And it will be a little bit of trial and error uh, hopefully you do have sufficient material to do that, but nonetheless that would be that would be what I'd recommend. Some of the proteases would be would be trypsin or a DNAs or something like that, uh, and, and certainly those are showcased or, or highlighted in in recipes on on the website or in textbooks as well. Uh, that, so that's that's certainly what I'd recommend. Okay, the next question is about teramide signal amplification. Uh, can I combine the vector stain ABC kit with the TSA system to amplify my IF signal? Oh, ab absolutely. Uh, the vector stain ABC kit uh, does uh, work on the principle of, it, it has a lot of horse radish peroxidase in it. Uh, the intended purpose being that it, it would be used for an enzymatic application, immunohistochemistry, whereby then you'd apply a substrate such as DAB and see that, that precipitate at the site of localization. However, uh, investigators uh, are exploiting the large amount of peroxidase in the ABC kit to help drive that tyramide amplification uh, in their immunofluorescence. So basically, you'd, you'd Put on your primary antibody, your biotinylated secondary antibody, the ABC kit, and then at that point you'd introduce the tyramide conjugate. In the in the case we showed earlier on, it'd be an Alexafluor 488 tyramide to then activate the, the the tyramide to precipitate down at the site of localization. So there certainly are publications out there and references where investigators have used the ABC kit. Uh, to get a very sensitive detection methodology for immunofluorescence. So yes, you can certainly do that. Hopefully that overview gave you a bit of an idea. All right, thank you, Craig. Our time is up for the Q&A session. Thank you for joining, joining our webinar. Uh, please feel free to uh, join our next webinar in three weeks on September 15th. We will send you the entire recording of this webinar through email. And if you did not have your answer questions during this session, we will personally answer your question at a later time, and we will also accept any new questions you may have uh, by using technical at vectorlabs.com. Right, thank you for coming to our webinar today, and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.